Nichols for joining us today for the NKRC faculty seminar. Um, we appreciate you being here. Um, Dr. Nichols actually gained his undergraduate degree in music from Truman State University in Kirksville, Missouri, before obtaining his DO from A.T. Still University, which is also in Kirksville. His passion for music can be seen through his tutorship as an undergrad to his medical career, where his research has looked into both manipulation of the voice and acoustical analysis. Other research has included neural therapy, prolotherapy, the potential cancer treating drug GCMAF, and ultrasound research in pre and post OMT. His current research endeavors include wearable fitness devices and their usefulness in medicine and um, surveying OMT in GME. Dr. Nichols' use of prolotherapy and medical practice and the benefits he's seen to his patients have him currently investigating a change in practice that would allow acceptance of quality prolotherapy to be reimbursed by insurance. Currently, it is not. Um, his passion for improving the lives of others, he demonstrates through his research and his advice to new doctors on staying passionate is to research what they're interested in and make sure it would have an impact. Again, thank you, Dr. Nichols, for being here. I'll remind everybody, please mute your mics, and um, I will stream questions in the end. Um, take it over, Dr. Nichols. Thanks. I realized I didn't change the title of this uh, <laughs> presentation until just a second ago. Um, I always use the KCU backgrounds whenever I'm talking for KCU. So um, today we are going to be talking about probably something that you've never heard of before, and that makes me excited. So neural therapy and the autonomic response, an uncommon but powerful way of treating pain. I'm gonna have lots of patient examples in this presentation for you all, um, and we'll get to those very soon. So in my mind, the best physicians can put themselves in their patient's shoes. And what that means to me is that a patient comes in, they're angry, they're irate, or they're just not doing well. I never take that personally. I always look and think about what's the worst thing that could have happened to that patient um, before they came in. You know, did they just get a divorce? Did their dog die? Um, what's going on? I never take things personally. And so, you know, in pain management, we often have a lot of angry, needy patients because they're they're miserable. They're miserable every day with just the daily pain that they work with, or they're depressed. And so, I feel that I'm a you know a good candidate to be a pain management doctor, be, which I am, is because I can do that. And so that's what I want you to do here in just a second. So in this first exercise, I want you to think about whether you closing, whether you want to close your eyes or not, think about that you've just been diagnosed with breast cancer. Let that sink in. Now the doctor tells you that the best therapy for this is a total mastectomy, bilateral. You're BRCA2 positive. So you now have hope. And then you go in and you have the surgery. And you have the uh, aesthetic augmentation to correct, you know, the, the visual aspects of that surgery afterwards. Now you have drains in normal, normal recovery. Now you find out that you have a staph infection in your right lung. Now you have a chest tube and a surgery and another surgery and another surgery and another surgery. 14 surgeries in total, 14 from start to finish. And what are you left with? No breast cancer, that's good. But you're also left with lancinating pain from your back all the way around your ribs from where they had to spread your ribs open and cut you open to help get the infection away. And so what do you do? You start going to doctors and they start probing you and prodding you and poking you nerve blocks, radio frequency ablations, opioids, Lyrica, all this stuff to try to fix this pain that was caused 
by original breast cancer surgery. Four years goes by, still in pain. Now not on opioids or Lyrica because you have five children to take care of at home. And all those drugs make you feel weird and mess with your mind. So with that being said, this patient ends up at my doorstep. And I give this patient the same spiel that I give to every patient. And I say, give me three tries, three strikeouts to try to help you fix your pain. And if I can't do it, I'll give, send you to someone else. So the first time I see this patient, a little bit of relief, not touching the lancinating pain though. The second time I say, look, I know you've been injected before, but I want to try something that you've never had before. It's a different type of injection. It's called neural therapy. Let's try this and see how you do. So what do I do? I inject this patient's scar, all their scars, all their drain sites um, around the nipple that she still has in place, her flap scar, all of them I inject. My anesthetic is on board for 12 hours. Her pain relief, 36 hours. How do you explain that? Well, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So today, I'm going to cover a lot of basics um, about neural therapy, what it is, how it works, side effects, and other things that you should be thinking about. So there are three layers to chronic musculoskeletal pain. One is a muscle spasm. That is the most superficial layer that we think of. That's when somebody comes in and they have the pain of, oh, you know, my back hurts, or what we would call somatic dysfunction. But what I'm trying to do as a pain management physician is to get to the root of the problem. So manipulation doesn't fix everything, especially if the root of the problem is much deeper. Deeper than muscle spasm, we have our connective tissue damage. And beneath that is the autonomic nervous system dysfunction. And that's what we were addressing. So to start, muscle spasms, what the patient's actually complaining about their pain. But again, if we dig deeper, we find out that the muscle spasm might be a cause of a previous lifting injury or ankle sprain, connective tissue damage. All this stuff leads to an autonomic nervous change in that localized area, sometimes remote to the area of the pain. So if we look at the autonomic nervous system, we see that it controls everything and it's very powerful. And we have a lot of great manipulation techniques to work on the autonomic nervous system, but sometimes that's not enough. So how is an autonomic nervous system damaged? Well, there's usually three basic causes. One is trauma, whether that's physical or even emotional, Another is infections or abscesses or foreign objects inside the body. So symptoms of autonomic nervous system is, first one is pain. Someone has pain. So autonomic mediated pain is often referred to as visceral pain, dull, diffuse, often accompanied by nausea. The patient can't quite put a finger on exactly where their pain is. So some of these examples might be, as you can see, bowel cramps, menstrual cramps, migraine headaches. Second symptom, restricted blood flow. So as we know, as if you're an osteopathic physician and you're thinking about doing, let's say, counter strain and trying to relax a muscle, you know that you get more blood flow through that constricted muscle or that muscle spasm. So smooth muscle of vessels not being regulated correctly or um, chronically constricting when, when they need to be open to those damaged areas. So basically, because there is a hypersympathetic activity in that area, we're having constriction of areas in that, that damaged segment. So another symptom, sorry about the spelling error there, um, tightening and contraction of the fascia around the area of the autonomic dysfunction. So fascia, as you all know, I'm sure, 
um, is the largest organ of the body. And it's the most amazing organ of the body in my view, because I'm a fascialist, not to be confused with a fascist. And so when I am treating my patients with OMT, I'm mostly focusing on the fascia. And the fascia is independent of the muscle spasms, but having a tight fascia can add to the muscle spasms. So the typical progression of, of this disease process is that ANS damage and dysfunction leads to decreased blood flow, which leads to constriction of connective tissues, which leads to decreased motion and results in somatic dysfunction. So I treat somatic dysfunction in my patients, but that's why I always have, say, give me three tries, is because the very first time they come to me, I'm gonna try the most benign treatment I can, tr I can think of, which is usually OMT. And then if that does absolutely nothing, then I either look elsewhere for my OMT um, or treatment, or I start adding acupuncture needles and, sorry, didn't mean to just put my middle finger up to y'all. Um, then I start adding acupuncture needles and trigger point injections. Sometimes within five minutes of touching the patient or palpating the patient, I can tell this is way deeper than what, what OMT can do. I need to bust out my anesthetics a lot quicker. And we'll talk about that. So one of the buzzwords with neural therapy is this interference field. What is an interference field? Interference fields are the areas of chronic hypopolarization, meaning they need a smaller stimulus to set the nerves off, and in some cases, no stimulus, and is required, required to trigger nerve action potential, which results in pain. So a review of basic nerve physiology this, I absolutely love this chart. So on the left side, you see the membrane resting potential. So a healthy nerve cell, let's say, needs negative 90 millivolts to trip off. An unhealthy nerve cell maybe needs half that, say negative 60, negative 45 millivolts to trip off and send a signal. And that signal in this case would be pain. So let's say you have a stimulus and the stimulus might be um, someone just touching you or your shirt brushing on that area of your of where you have an unhealthy nerve cell, and that trip will cause pain. But a healthy nerve cell does not trip off. If there's any questions about that, I would love to answer that now. Feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt me at any time. Dr. Nichols, I actually have a question. This is Shelly. You know, when you talk about healthy versus unhealthy nerve. Um, I guess, could you kind of um, clarify for me if this would also apply to somebody that maybe has nerve damage because of autoimmune disorders, um, or if you're referring to specifically nerve damage due to um, trauma, like such as what you've been describing that leaves scars and scar tissue behind? No, there's a lot of other disease processes that cause um, nerve sensitivity to happen. And so this this sort of threshold that you're showing here, because I love this graph too, would it, that would apply to to you know whether it's a disease progression or you know scar tissue like you said or something else? This is overall we can say this would be true for for a nerve cell regardless of the individual. Yes, I believe so. Okay, thank Sorry, you. Sorry, I got confused there for a second while I was listening to you. <laughs> no, thank you. That answers my question. So what is neural therapy? Neural therapy is an injection treatment that addresses and resolves interference fields and corrects the underlying autonomic nervous system dysfunction, thereby resolving the chronic pain because you're taking care of the most basic layer of the dysfunction. Now, once you take care of the most basic layer of the, of the dysfunction, that there still could be stuff that needs to be done. Let's say that I have a very torn up ankle from repeated ankle sprains. If I take care of the pain, that's great, but my ankle is still very lax and prone to injury. So with that being said, I will still probably do something like prolotherapy to strengthen my ankle ligament and maybe some physical therapy and rehab. So the history of neural therapy goes back uh, about 100 years, and there's a lot of doctors that utilized um, these anesthetics when they first came out. So this is back in the Wild West days of, hey, you know, we now have procaine. 
uh, also known as Novocaine, you know, um, what what can we do to, you know, fix people's pain? Let's just start shooting them up with, you know, anesthetics. You know, again, there's no insurance back then. There's there's no you know big randomized controlled trials that we need to to work on. Uh, we're just we're just trying things out. And then here comes Clean Heart in '93 and Williams, and they add autonomic response testing onto this and really organize the whole thing that's been going on for about the the previous 60, 70 years. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So theories of how and why neural therapy works. Um, so one is the fascial continuity theory, that trauma causing scarring in the fascia and adhesion between fascial planes. Therefore, neural therapy separates these, which stops the pain. And when I say separate these, we're talking about hydrodissection, taking an anesthetic into like a scar or uh, not a great... Um, well-organized fascial system and literally separating it out and giving that scar tissue. So technically we're creating a little bit of trauma because we're separating out scar tissue, but then we're also allowing it to regrow in a more organized manner. Ooh, I, ooh, I should have put a picture in here about uh, organized fascia and scar tissue. Sorry. So another theory is the lymphatic system where smooth muscle contraction in the lymphatics caused by sympathetic hypertonia, hy yeah, which results in lymphatic congestion and pain. Neurotherapy neutralizes the sympathetic hypertonia because of the anesthetic, thereby allowing rapid drainage of congestion and toxic tissues and reduction of pain. So one of the things that I should have mentioned back here is with neural therapy, what I'm doing is I'm taking something, my preferred uh, drug is Procaine 1%, and I inject it into whatever area I'm thinking I need to treat. And what that does actually is take that unhealthy nerve cell and hyperpolarizes it. So it takes it from, let's say, negative 60 to negative 200. I'm, I'm just throwing out random numbers here. Basic science guys, don't roast me. Um, but by doing that, I'm essentially giving that nerve cell a pain holiday where it's not going to trip up no matter what because the anesthetic is on board. But I use Procaine because its half-life is very short and it, it, it's off board in about 30 minutes to an hour. So when a person comes back and tells me that they've had relief for about 24 or 36 hours, I say, that's great. We're on the right track. We're doing what we need to be doing because that anesthetic was only on board for an hour max. And when they look at me, and they're like, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah. So that extra 35 hours that you got of relief was telling me that this is, we're doing the right thing. So sometimes it's a one and done deal, sometimes it's not. So nervous system theory, the chronic aberrant neurological output over time causes the ANS to start to malfunction, thus setting up a regional pain syndrome. So what we have is that unhealthy nerve cell we do the neural therapy local anesthetic. We release the toxins in the metabolic waste. And over time, that unhealthy nerve cell gains its hyper, its polarity back to where it should be to get back to the happy nerve cell again. Sometimes it's a one and done deal. Sometimes it takes a while. The ground system theory. Since the interference field is secondary to chronic hypopolarization of the neurons, which causes aberrant electrical output from the ANS, which in turn causes a conformational change into the matrix of the fascia, neural therapy corrects this aberrant output, and the fascia, fascia immediately returns to a healthy matrix conformation. So a lot of stuff there, but let's get to the meat and potatoes of what, what we do here. So methods of diagnosis. Um, so whenever I'm seeing a patient in my pain clinic for the first time, I take a very detailed history of when did this start? When did your injury start? So here's a case example. I had a female come into my pain management clinic and she says, I have left hip pain. I've had it for years. I said, okay, tell me what happened years ago. And she said, I had a C-section three years ago, and it wasn't that easy. She didn't just come out and tell me. I had to really tease that out of her. So her hip pain started somewhere around the time of her C-section, not before, but pretty close to afterwards. 
And so, so the first time I saw her, I did my benign treatment of just treating her with OMT. Didn't help. And I thought, okay, I think my next step is I would really like to inject your C-section scar. So C-section scar is here, left hip scar. I don't even know if you guys can see me because um, I don't see myself up here. So thanks, Mark. Um, so C-section scar is here, left hip pain on like the greater trochanter. She's had greater trochanter greater trochanter steroid injection. She's had manipulation. She's had a lot of stuff, physical therapy even. Nothing helped. So by taking my 1% of procaine and injecting it intradermally, that's intradermally, not sub-Q, um, I just injected her C-section scar. Immediately, her hip pain, which is about a foot away, disappeared. Didn't come back for, I think, four days. So that was a person that I had to do another round of an injection on. But once I do my initial injection, that area is pretty much numb. And when I'm injecting scars, scars typically don't have a whole lot of sensi sensitization in them. Um, some can, but for the most part, they're, they're already numb. So because of the dysfunctional nerves. Um, so that's just one area of that, that temporal association that, hey, you had the C-section scar, or C-section, and then your hip started hurting. So let's go back to the C-section scar, and then her hip pain went away. So one example of that temporal association. Empirical approach. So sometimes we use known associations between interference fields and the areas of pain. So an example is an interference field caused by uh, ear piercing will sometimes cause neck or shoulder pain. So if I know that, then I think, well, What's the harm in injecting a little bit of anesthetic where your ear piercing is? And let's see if it changes anything. A systemic approach, um, which is a great one to do, but not one not great to do in the insurance world, is basically touch every part of the body, autonomic response test, which I'll talk about in a little bit, every part of the body, and find what, what's going on. So this, I actually do this with my OMT, not just so much with neural therapy. And it's so funny that, you know, I'll, I'll say, have you ever had a surgery? Have you ever had a major injury? And then I start working on my patient's feet and they're like, oh yeah, I sprained that ankle 10 times. And they, that didn't come out in the initial history because when you start t touching parts of the body, they makes that mental connection of, oh yeah, I did have that issue. So for this one, we literally just test everything we treat everything that is positive and i'll talk about that in just a second another one is proximity so scars and trauma sites in close proximity to the area of symptomatology are more likely to be causative causative and that, that's one we're going to treat um but note that any interference field in the body can cause symptoms anywhere else and i, I got tons of examples i i'm just itching to tell you guys um, so autonomic response testing. Oh my goodness. If you guys do not know this stuff, this will blow your mind. And I will do this in person with every single one of you whenever I get a chance to see you. So autonomic response testing is a form of applied key. Uh, we do have a, a question, um, yes. Dr. Nichols. Uh, go ahead, Kenneth Zermeski. Hey, Jared. Um, would you kind of define interference field for us? Yes. So it's an area of chronic hypopolarization where the area of that body or the skin is susceptible to being tripped off very easily because it is not at a, the healthy nerve level. It's at the unhealthy nerve level. And that's a continuum. That's not like a, I just stepped over the unhealthy nerve level. So you're talking about specifically locally, but uh, aren't you also referring to regional fields? Yes, so that area can have a regional effect. Pain or symptoms distal to wherever that interference field is. Again, the example would be the UC section scar creating hip, pelvis, and sacral pain. Yes. Cool. Thanks. Cool. So lastly, the proximity, um, 
any interference field in the body can have something elsewhere. And we'll talk about uh, that in a little bit. So autonomic response testing. So this is the most reliable and efficient diagnostic tool when correctly done. And so this is where Klingheart really came into the the limelight in 93 when he kind of paired autonomic response testing with this neural therapy. Before, physicians were just injecting all these different areas just like trial and error to say, hey, I wonder if this will help. But when we paired it with autonomic response testing, it gave us like just an x-ray vision of it. This is exactly where you need to be working. And what that looks like is, let's say, um, it's it's kind of a special form of muscle strength testing, and this is where I wish I had a person that I could just demonstrate on, because uh, I love this. It just like blows people mind, blows people's minds like a party trick. Um, but basically, I'm having the person. I'm testing some sort of muscle, and I will usually cover over their belly button, make sure that they're in exhalation, and I just test the strength of their 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 bicep. And I do this with my hand off the umbilicus and then with my hand on the umbilicus. And because the umbilicus is the first scar we ever develop, that is usually positive in almost every person. So what happens, I know this is gonna be really weird to try to understand because it, it really is like so profound that let's say that somebody has a sternotomy scar from a cabbage and it's just a, a very irritated area. When I touch that scar and make that physical connection with that scar, and then I try to bring their hand down, they will have absolutely no strength and cannot resist my five or 10 or 15 pounds of force, depending on the patient, and their arm will go straight down. Now, if that scar is really significant and they hold their breath, then all of a sudden they have all that strength again and they, I will not be able to put their arm down. It, it, it's that's this is basically a teaser for like a whole nother talk because that's a whole different thing that we're talking about neural therapy not autonomic response testing but this is just absolutely practice changing so to come future talk to come for sure yes thank you shelly <laughs> yeah so um patients will sometimes give you clues um and say you know like They'll, they'll be itching their scar or they'll relay an emotional event or they'll tell you something that kind of clues you into like, oh, you didn't tell me that before. And so sometimes a, a course, along the course of the treatments, you'll find out that you're, you're taking care of kind of one layer, but then, you know, it's like a layer of an onion. It just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And that these patients will have deeper seated issues that you're going to have to tease out and that's one of the arts of medicine i absolutely love is that you know yeah you can take care of their superficial pain but then you start to realize that after you take care of your superficial pain there's a lot more underneath that so how do we treat um so we use a direct anesthetic infusion into the dysfunctional area of the autonomic ner nervous system so this could be a deep autonomic ganglia or it can also be intracutaneous into the most peripheral areas of the nerves that are actually tripped up. So deep ganglia are kind of the classic way of neural therapy and they're very effective but they're also greater risk. So I really we tend to not do that as much. We tend to stick in the intracutaneous uh, area. Sphenopalatine ganglia block, um, I actually had this done to me in February at a neural therapy conference that I presented at. And it's funny, I had a concussion in my, I want to say, first year of medical school. So we're talking a lot of years, over a decade ago. And I had a, a football that hit the right side of my head. And so I've always had right-sided eye pain. And I've been treated with cranial. I've been, you know, I went through fellowship. I worked with fellows of the academy, you know, really great manipulators. But after I got this ganglia block, that was the first time that Dr. Joy was able to treat my head and really have a significant response. So sometimes, you know, manipulation can't just take everything out, but you need to treat the nerves first so that the fascia can respond. So uh, another one, stellate ganglion block. I did this as well. It did not look like this. I actually had my fingers spread uh, across the area of the stellate ganglia, and I did it that way. Uh, when I injected somebody practicing, I didn't just like, you know, have my hand up in the air, just injecting somebody's neck. That looks really scary. 
Um, inferior hypogastric or Frankenhauser plexus block. Uh, this is one I've done as well and had done to me. Uh, very interesting. You feel a zing down there uh, when you're in the right spot, but um, also very effective. These are some of the deep ganglia blocks. Also, I don't practice these in my clinic um, because I take insurance and that's, yeah. But doctors that do neural therapy like all the time, uh, these are kind of mainstays. So segmental therapy, this is when it's deemed too risky to inject a deep ganglia. You can inject the skin areas innervated by the cutaneous branches of these ganglia. This is kind of what I do. Um, and so you have a lot of pain referral areas. And honestly, when I'm injecting, I'm just focusing on the interference fields or wherever I find that it's positive, or I'll just inject in the scars. Um, so if you can see in the middle here, this intracutaneous quadal, this is what my injection will look like in that interference field if I find one. You'll see that the pores of, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but the pores will actually kind of expand. And so again, it's not a subcutaneous wheel, it's an intracutaneous quadal. It looks very different. So scars are basically the focus of my practice. The why, because of insurance and where I work right now. If I was cash only, then I would be doing that, just treat everything, uh, systemic approach. But scars are really where I focus. And so in the patient I first started talking to you guys about, I was focusing on her surgical scars, her dermatological uh, biopsy sites. Um, also, if somebody has a big trauma site, like a, a fractured ankle, um, scar without a scar, crush injuries, blunt force traumas, punctures, bites, other things would be uh, tattoos. So this is what it looks like. I usually use a three millimeter, uh, sorry, a three cc uh, syringe and with a 30 gauge needle, one and a half inches. I bend the needle so I can go into the scar. And if you see here, you can actually see the, need, the needle in the, the skin. So it's going right along the skin right there. And it's not deep at all. And if I'm doing my job right, you can, actually see the needle itself because I'm in such a superficial layer right at that skin. And you see here that it's starting to blow up that scar and they're coming along here as you can see. So here you can see the raised skin area and areas that they're trying to treat with scars. So what are the side effects of this? So one is a lightning response, meaning basically immediately as you inject that, that patient's pain is gone. And that is the greatest feeling in the world. And it, it, I absolutely love it that, you know, I, I always have to tell my patients, yeah, this may only be temporary, but I want to know how long your pain stays away. Another one is a delayed response where somebody really doesn't have a reaction initially, but then they get better. Another one is an emotional release. And this is the biggest like thing I have to talk about with my patients. And I make a big deal about this. I remember when I first started neural therapy on myself from my previous physician that I learned all this stuff from, um, I went to Home Depot with my wife and we weren't even, we didn't own a house at the time. We were renting, renting down in Texas. And I got in the biggest fight with her about light bulbs, light bulbs, or something else that had nothing to do with anything we had going on. Um, and so within about 48 hours, you're kind of in this time period after your first or second um, round of neural therapy that where you can just have those emotions that you have tied up to whatever injury you have just start to come out. And because we always want to have a reason for something, we look at the world around us and try to figure out what is causing me to feel this way. And of course we can't find anything, but I always have to warn my patients that you need to tell your spouse, your family, whatever, that this could be a possibility. That in the next two days, you could have a, just a, be crying for no reason. You could be angry for no reason. And it's just one of those things that I really have to tell them about for 
my wife, she just dealt with that. And it wasn't until after the fact that I realized, oh, that was that emotional release we were talking about. You know, we didn't buy light bulbs that day. Another one, it could be euphoria. They just feel great. Oh my gosh, my pain's gone. I feel amazing. You know, just another one. Um, another one is this uh, Nalkov, which is uh, primarily in females described as a wave of pleasant warmth in the head, which lasts for a short period of time after the injection. And then a reverse phenomenon where for some reason that patient actually gets worse for, for the brief period of time and then they start to improve. So symptoms of improper or incomplete treatment. So if a patient gets relief, but it doesn't last. So if it's short lived in the area, but something else comes up, um, then we know that we're, we didn't get everything that we needed to get at that treatment. Um, symptoms aggravated, then slowly return to previous level of pain, but not better. So usually I would expect my patients to have some sort of level of improvement, um, even if they got worse and then they usually get better. And that just means that you didn't quite get the right spot. And that happened with my patient with post mastectomy pain syndrome is that I thought I was in the right spot. And then I realized, oh, her pain is actually one centimeter higher I just wasn't quite there. And when you inject those intracutaneous quaddles into your patients, um, you'll know you're in the right spot because it, it literally won't look like that little round wheel. It'll look like it'll just blow up and take all this medicine with it. Um, and, and it will just be a very prominent uh, visual thing to see. So uh, treated area gets better, but another area becomes worse. Um, I've had this before. I actually, uh, when I was going through this process, and again, I was a physician, I was studying under this doctor, you know, he did my ankle and some other areas, and he would always send me home, which he would not do with a regular patient, about two cc's or one cc um, syringe or whatever was left over. I remember I left his office, and then all of a sudden, I was in the parking lot of Michael's in my van, and right here in my hand, I just got the the worst like itching burning sensation and so i took that needle out and i just injected myself intracutaneously and all of a sudden it was gone never came back again i don't know what my injury there was actually i have a biopsy site right there but that so that's what it was but you know that took care of it and just the example that you never know what could be causing issues of autonomic dysfunction so another, another example of retrograde phenomenon, patient with low, low back pain and headaches, you treat the pelvic plexus and the patient's pain goes away, but the headache worsens. And then you find that they have an interference field on their scalp or their hair. So totally um, just like my example, you know, you find something else is going on. So contraindications and precautions, cancer, genetic abnormality, pregnancy, diabetes, it's relative. Uh, tuberculosis, major psychiatric illness, uh, mostly for the emotional factor. Uh, nutritional deficiency, um, nutritional factors, um, you know, because you're working on something and you're trying to get the connective tissue to better itself, anything that's needed for connective tissue synthesis is necessary. So silicone is one of those, zinc, vitamin C, potassium, and here are some other ones that are very important, just to make sure. And so some doctors will test for these. Uh, magnesium is chronically deficient in most Americans um, because our vegetables are just We've used that soil so much that just even the stuff that should have lots of magnesium in it doesn't have as much as it should. So hidden interference fields, um, occipital ridge, thighs, ankle sprains, epidural site injections, scar tissues, dental fields, that's huge. Dental stuff is, is a really, really big one. Uh, tattoos and body piercings, man, tattoos are hard because especially if they're large and if that's really the cause of their issue, I don't really find a lot of tattoos to be the issue, but if it is, it's not an easy one to treat. Um, any, I mean, just any trauma that somebody has had in their life. And when I say trauma, you know, jamming your thumb playing basketball is a trauma. I don't mean like something huge, but heartbreak is a trauma. You know, there's a lot of different types of trauma that we, experience in our lives and those thousands of little traumas add up to make who we are today so kind of to summarize trauma can cause the areas of autonomic nervous system dysfunction 
and we call these interference fields. Interference fields, when treated by neural therapy, can resolve chronic pain. It might also require prolotherapy or some other therapy um, or physical therapy or rehab in addition. And the areas of connective tissue pain which are left can then be treated with, oh, I just said that, sorry. I was talking off the cuff. So I studied under Dr. Gerald Harris, um, who is in uh, Arlington, Texas, or Fort Worth, Texas. He is um, very well known in the neural therapy community, and I think the current president of the AOA PRM, American Osteopathic Association of Prolo and Regenerative Medicine. And that's kind of where I focus my practice is, is keeping people away from uh, surgery, you know, trying to find the root cause of their pain. Sometimes I say that I'm kind of like Dr. House for pain, where I'm a pain diagnostician. I'm just trying to get to the bottom point of why they have pain. And one thing about me is that I never give up. I never give up if somebody has pain. Even if they have cerebral palsy and I know exactly what their, you know, they have some sort of neural, th neural issue that's causing their physical ailments, I still always look if there's another reason for why they have the pain or maybe sometimes it's a new one. So bringing it home, if you're not proficient in neural therapy, injecting, and this is like what I teach my students and my residents, just inject the scars intradermally uh, in close proximity to the problem area and maybe bring the patient added relief. Um, that's what I did with my post mastectomy pain syndrome patient. I did my poster on last uh, spring, and that's what I do with most of my patients due to insurance barriers. But in general, you're talking about injecting a very short acting anesthetic into the intracutaneous areas. And I'm not going to talk about the deep ganglia stuff, but if you do it well, you can, it's just so profound how much relief people can get. And I, it's, it's frustrating for a physician like me that there's not more access to this type of treatment, this and prolotherapy, because it, it changes people's lives. So in my experience, when you treat all three layers of the pain with neural therapy, prolotherapy, physical rehabilitation, you can get 90% of your chronic pain patients, at least 85 to 90% pain relief. And when I say 90% of your chronic pain patients, that is 100% of the patients that were told it's all in your head. There's nothing we can do. You just have to take medicine. It's, we're not talking about chronic pain patients that got better with physical therapy. We're, we're talking about the, the hopeless cases, the patients that we're, we're given up on. And so that's kind of like my bleeding heart thing where I, I try to reach out to those people and, and try to help them as much as possible. So one case that I had, 34-year-old Caucasian female, female, torn glenoid labrum 10 years ago, has a history of spousal abuse, chronic mid-back pain, neck pain, bilateral leg radiculopathy, that's not dermatomal, um, states she has difficulty going upstairs, but her strength is strong, dyspareunia, she sees a pelvic floor therapist, weekly emotionally support counseling. This lady had a lot of mental um, trauma. Uh, she's on an antidepressant, one vaginal de delivery, um, no uh, drug abuse. So I treated her with OMT the first visit. The second visit, she had resolution of neck pain and then left rib pain kind of started up. And then so after treating her again with OMT, she had this big somato emotional release after treating her anterior trauma point uh, from a previous MVA, I believe. So she was in tears in my office while she was on the table. And, but she did mention later that she had a great counseling session the next day. So the third visit, she had worsening back pain after weightlifting. Um, it, she also noted some weakness and sensory changes. I ordered an MRI because there were sensory changes that were new. Uh, MRI was negative. She had a left posterior sacrum. I articulated it back in. It was a huge pop. And I think that was a big cause of what she was uh, feeling with the, um, the, the leg radiculopathy. And so the fifth visit, all of her lower extremity symptoms completely resolved. She continued to have mid-back pain, and I kept treating it. And so I added in, at this point, autonomic response testing. Note, I did not do any neural therapy on this person. This was all OMT. Um, but I did the autonomic response testing, and it showed me that her left ribs were not the priority. And again, this is for another 
lecture talking about autonomic response testing, but it, it kind of point led me to the point of where what was her priority. So I treated her left obturator internus for about a good two plus minutes with counter strain, and then that was fixed. And then the left ribs now popped up as it was like the main issue. And I treated that and everything was great. And her dyspareunia, which I never touched that area, um, that was fixed too. So the highlights of this is I'm always looking for the cause of the chronic lesion and what the root cause is. And remember that just because they're saying that their pain is in one area doesn't mean that's the root cause of the pain. The body's so amazing in the fact that you can have pain in one area or an issue in one area and have pain in a very distal area uh, where your initial trauma is. So highlights, and again, this should probably be in the next lecture is autonomic response testing may be useful in finding the sequence that the body wants you to be treated. Um, another person I had, uh, left greater trochanteric bursitis, wants to know if a steroid injection might help. I'm pretty anti-steroid injections um, because steroid in steroids are anti-inflammatory. They can cause degeneration of the cartilage or um, the, the, the connective tissue. And so I, I try to stay away from them. And so I, I just thought, hey, this is when I was learning about all this stuff in my fellowship. I thought, let's just do autonomic response testing. Well, the greater trochanter was strong, meaning their muscle was strong. They had no issue with that. So, but their left iliolumbar ligament in their back was weak. So I did counter strain to their iliolumbar ligament and they had complete resolution of their symptoms. So again, just another thing is that don't think that where someone says their pain is, is necessarily the problem. Um, so here are some of my resources, uh, Neural Therapy book by Robert Kidd. I currently have that check out from the library. I hope I can find it. Um, but that that's a great overview book and a starting place of what Neural Therapy is. Atlas of Neural Therapy by Matthias, Matthias Dosh. Um, I have another one. I guess it's upstairs. Uh, Manual Therapy, Manual of Neural Therapy, um, according to Hunke and Matthias Dosh, and then the newest book on neural therapy um, by the person I studied under, Dr. Harris, and the other two doctors were residents underneath me when I was a fellow, is the structural medicine, the effective treatment of chronic pain. So uh, while I pull up my poster here, one of the things that I think was really interesting is I recently had a, a person uh, close to me that um, had chronic left back pain ever since her last C-section. And so I tried to manipulate her back um, and rib. It was mostly left-sided rib pain. She couldn't sleep very well. And I never really had much success. And then I kind of said, I really don't think this is your back because I have confidence in my skills and I know that if I'm making a difference or not. And so I said, you know, what else is going on? When did this start? And that's when it went back to the C-section again. So I scheduled her to come over and we did a C-section scar injection. And then I worked on her back again and her back just articulated so easily. It was, it was cake. And she still to this day, this is now three and a half months later, has no left shoulder pain um, and back pain. So that, that was amazing. That was a one and done, and I love that. I had another person with a pain implant um, scar that I ended up injecting and fixed her like leg weakness. It's just, just so amazing. I can't believe more people don't do this. So this is my poster from last spring. Um, this is the patient that I started out uh, the day with. Again, total of four, 14 surgeries, nine out of 10 burning, lancinating pain along her ribs and her breast. Um, she's had previously epidural steroid injections, intercostal nerve blocks, osteopathic manipulation, acupuncture. So I injected this patient with bupivacaine and lidocaine because that's what I had in a sterile water mixture, 111. And with, you can see that's my 3cc syringe. I have my one and a half inch 30 gauge needle there. Um, and so you can see at the first treatment, this patient reports no pain for two and a half days. And she had pain for the previous five years. Treatment two patient reports no pain for 30 hours, but now she had new surgical scars that I previously did not treat that were now painful. That's that retrograde phenomenon that we talked about. Treatment three, patient reports pain-free for several days. Again, this stuff doesn't even last 
24 hours. So several days of pain free when she's been having this for five years is just like, I love hearing that um, as a physician. She notes that she's developing actual sensation in her left nipple. She didn't have a right nipple. She only had her left nipple where she had previously had no sensation at all. So treatment four, she notes 90% improvement from her five year burning nerve pain. Treatment five, patient noted only 30 seconds, three times a week of pain. So constant burning, nine out of 10, lancinating nerve pain to 30 seconds, three times a week after five treatments, 14 surgeries, five years of pain. And I'm using each time less than maybe $5 of supplies. Crazy. Just love it. Love it, love it, love it. Sorry, soapbox. I'm done sharing my screen. I have no idea what time it is. I talked a long time. No, that was amazing. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. That was a very great talk. I was um, definitely engaged right from the beginning with your sort of imaginative um, exercise that you had us all go through. Um, If there's any questions, I'd be happy to um, take any questions for Dr. Nichols. Um, I have a question. Uh, I was wondering whether or not, um, because some of the things that you mentioned, uh, the drugs that you're using to treat made me think of like, you know, lidocaine, benzocaine, things that you can buy over the counter as like numbing gels. Um, Have you, does topical application of anything to the scar sites help improve some of these symptoms? So to skin sites, yes. To scar sites, somewhat. But whenever I'm injecting into a scar, a big portion of it also is the hydrodissection that happens when I'm physically infiltrating that that scar. And um, let me go back to my um, poster presentation, wherever my PowerPoint is, it disappeared. It's here somewhere. All right, it's not working right now. But um, you can actually see the infiltration of the scar at that point. And it, it's just, it's one of those ASMR things <laughs> that we talked about earlier. It's just a very uh, fulfilling thing to know that you're, you know, you're doing something, you're doing it right. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree. This is, this is just amazing. Um, I loved hearing your talk. Uh, we've got a couple more questions. Um, let's see, Dr. Wolf, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that the, the hydro aspect of that, and that was actually, I, I was curious if you've ever given just saline. I mean, would you get a different result if you if you did saline in, instead uh, of, of the procaine? Potentially, but when you're using the autonomic response testing, that's, that's the one that's telling you that you're actually having a nerve issue uh, or, or a, a distal nerve issue. And so that's why the anesthetic is so important in that case. Um, now using saline in just a normal scar that doesn't have an issue is, yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, okay. other than it would hurt. Then the, the follow up to that had to do with which nerves are you actually deadening? I, I mean, are you deadening a Delta and C fibers or are you, I mean, how, how are you so certain that you are actually exerting your effects on the autonomic nerves rather than the the other pain innervation to that area. Well, you're affecting all the nerves in that area. Yeah, well, I was going to say, but do you, so you, but some are more, more or less susceptible. I mean, when you're using drugs that like, uh, like lidocaine or whatever, those, those tend to work on the fires that, on the fibers that are firing most frequently. Is my recollection. It's been quite a while since I, I taught that, but that that's my recollection of how they work. Well, before I answer this question or, or comment, I'll start by saying that you're definitely more of an expert in this than I am. Um, but you know, if you're having a, a nerve that's firing more frequently, those are the nerves that you want to be addressing because those are the ones that are hypopolarized. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Like when you when you go to the dentist or whatever. I mean the. You're, you deaden the pain because those those fibers fire more often and and they get have their channels blocked by virtue of that. 
Yeah, okay. and that, that's yeah, actually thanks. something I'd love to work I, I, I didn't, I didn't have an answer. Yeah, I didn't have an answer myself, and I thought you maybe maybe had one for that. I, I would. I, I will look into that. That's uh, something I hadn't thought of before. Thank you. Marcus? Yes. Uh, Jared, thank you for a very exciting talk. I, I found myself just as excited as you were as you were going through your presentation. My question is, uh, basically, for the patients that uh, entered your office for treatment, what would percentage would you say uh, of those patients were on uh, antidepressant medications? And uh, after treatment, uh, because I'm assuming that at some point of a chronic pain, you're gonna, it's gonna make you depressed somewhere. But what percentage of patients would you estimate uh, remained on those antidepressant medications versus ones who were found themselves enough to pull themselves off? That's a good question, and it's hard to answer because I see both acute and chronic pain. But for my chronic pain patients, if it depends on if I really do my job well, I never know the answer to your question because they never come back. And so <laughs> I, I kind of made it a habit towards the end of my practice when before COVID hit to say, hey, if you're doing great, will you just give us a call and let us know? Because sometimes mm -hmm. people will just they'll be they'll ghost you and you're like, what why what what happened? Like that was I a terrible doctor or you know what what exactly happened? And usually I think the answer is that you did such a good job that they're pain free and they forgot that they even had an issue in the first place. Um, but, you know, in general, a large amount of patients that have chronic pain are on some sort of antidepressant. Would you say yeah. that's true, Dr. Zermsky? Yeah, I see him shaking his head. I can't give you a percentage, Marcus. I'm sorry. All right. I was just, you know, I, I even a ballpark guess works well with me. If there's not a study out there, that should be one. Interesting research. Some of the beginning, because my uh, life size blanked out on me. Um, I just talked about my post mastectomy pain patient that I did my poster on. Right. The, the uh, percentages, what were you looking for? He was talking about percentage of chronic pain patients on SSRIs or SNRIs. Hmm. I said a lot. But I'm pretty sure there's research out there for that like that's pretty a common question yeah I, I don't know what percentage end up being placed on them but seeing as how that's considered one of the uh, primary treatment recommendations uh, it's pretty high would you assume that it's a, a at least a reduction based on your you know no scientific study but just on your best guess estimate so if I treat somebody with neural therapy and we're actually taking care of the root cause, um, some patients just say, no, I don't want an injection of any type at all. And again, this is not like a deep injection. This is not a muscle trigger point. This is literally in your skin, like a, a TB test, you know, actually even more superficial than a TB test. But if you can do that, then it's just, yes, absolutely. Their lives change. You know, the lady that had the post mastectomy pain syndrome, she went off all of her medications after after being, you know, doing that. And I didn't write down all of her medications. I have it in my confidential file somewhere, her, all of her records. But um, just absolutely, it's transformative. Yeah, okay. I was going to add, I don't think it's just the antidepressants, but the, the opioids and the pain medications, I'm sure if you can reduce their pain that you're seeing a reduction in these patients that are taking opioids. And with that, that being a major thing right now to reduce the, the chance of um, addiction that these people could develop from that, I think, to get to the root of the cause of their pain. Um, I mean, you're doing, you know, amazing work. I mean, heavenly, some would say, because I'm sure they think you're an angel when they walk out of there without any pain. Yep, I've, I've heard that before. Um, hands of Jesus, yeah. <laughs> that's that's yes. what some, some have said in the past. Uh, I, 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 you know, I. it's not my power, it's his power. But um, yeah. it, it's just, I, I just can't, you know, I, I know a lot of you guys are probably thinking like, this is just, he's blowing this out of proportion. This is way, it can't be that good. No, man, it really is. It's just, it's insane. 
And for me, I always have my syringe, my sterile water and my procaine at home. So when my in-laws come and they have a little pain here and there, my father-in-law, I, I injected his back in some areas, interference fields he had, and he ended up needing surgery, but at least I could get him pain-free um, for several days when my anesthetic lasted 30 minutes, you know? So that's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Wolf, I see your hands up again. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was curious if and when you encounter failures, are, are there similarities in those patients as well? What, what do you mean by failures? Well, I, I, when people don't necessarily feel that you helped them or whatever, have you ever interviewed them? I mean, what, what do people say? Or I guess, you know, there's, there's different types of pain and there's different, man, or different manifestations of pain. So are there some sorts of pain that you seem to do better with than others? Absolutely. So that's why I have so many tools in my toolbox. You know, I always start with manipulation to looking at the most superficial le level of pain, being musculoskeletal or connective tissue or fascia. And then when sometimes very quickly, actually, I realize this is not going to work. And then I have to know that I have to go deeper into that level of um, those three levels of, you know, muscle spasm, connective tissue disruption, and then autonomic nervous system. I know that I have to go deeper to try to figure out how to help that patient. If I don't have success, then I look elsewhere. And that's why I always tell my patients, I give me three strikes is because if after the first time, didn't do anything. All right, I'm going to look elsewhere. I'm not going to do the same thing I did last time. I'm not going to think that OMT in this one area is going to fix this patient. I need to think elsewhere. I need to ask further questions. If I get to that third time of not figuring out what's going on with that patient or even being able to affect any change, I basically go all the way back to the root history and say, what are we missing? What haven't you told me? What, what do I need to know to help you? And almost all the time, I know Dr. Zremski will be on board with this, is that we are able to help someone somewhat, sometimes a lot, sometimes not a lot. Um, but what I look for is change. If something has changed, then we're on the right track. And then I'll keep going on with that patient. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Talley. I see your hands up. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm just one of those people who's lucky enough to have some an autoimmune disorder called pemphigus. And uh, earlier in my life, when I was jumping my horse, I flew off the horse and landed on my head. And this is a different mechanism, I know, but it's important. I'm not sure people realize how important it is not to have to take pain meds and that kind of thing. So I was having, and, and the only thing I could take was corticosteroids because I'm allergic to a lot of pain meds. And so I also had to take muscle relaxers. I mean, it was ridiculous. And the guy at KCU who used to run the employee clinic with me on, on the, um, what is it, muscle release or muscle when it gets really... Direct uh, inhibition, yes, muscle release. Yes, I understand. Yeah. And that, being taught that and being able to use it, I got off all of my meds and I can control the pain immediately. It's an amazing thing to be able to do this. And I'm not sure people realize, I mean, they think that yeah, this can't be because it's not a pill, but it's just, it, this is amazing stuff. And one of the great things about my clinic is that I don't prescribe opioids. I mean, technically I do, but it's mostly when I'm in the ER or we're talking maybe 0.01% of my patient population, I would actually prescribe an opioid to. And that really helps weed out people that would just waste my time otherwise that don't really want to get better and they're just looking for something. Um, so the patients that come to me, I know that they're sincere and that, that's just a, a blessing. Yeah, I mean, again, thank you, Dr. Nichols, not just for the talk, but for what you do. I think that, you know, the mission of KCU can't 
be any stronger than the work that you're doing with your compassion and your commitment to trying to make people's lives better. So again, thank you for your talk today and for joining us. Um, if nobody else has any other questions, um, I'll remind you that next week we do have uh, another seminar by Dr. Ashroff from Freeman and also a journal club presentation that would follow. So um, if there's no other questions, I'd say reveal yourselves. Thanks, Dr. Nichols, for coming. And everybody have a nice weekend. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye.